everyone. This is update for August 23, 2022, day 181 of the war end of the date update. So today we complete we have completed six months uh, of this war. Uh, so uh, this is uh, very, as a summary, I would say nobody expected that Ukraine could hold on for so long. Um, and Ukraine itself, uh, it's always a thanks to support uh, from the West, otherwise Ukraine would fall a long time ago. Uh, now let's switch to uh, general and general discussion and we're gonna look at the energy situation because this is uh, the situation is getting worse sort of by day and there is no reprieve in sight. So we do recommend everyone, to prepare the, to the best you can personally um, because based on experiences in Ukraine uh, people who were prepared survived people who, who were not did not survive uh, in this way life is very I'd say uh, you cannot fool life and you cannot sort of sort of ask for excuses so in a way merciless merciless uh, now, so you can see that the prices for electricity are uh, through the roof uh, in most of the Europe, with exception of like northern Sweden and northern Norway, where they somewhat sort of more normal. But we believe there is not much of uh, economic activity there. There is not much of sort of production, uh, well, uh, industrial production. So there is no much uh, of offtake, and that's probably the reason why they are so low right now there however if you look at the main powerhouses right germany france uh, uh, uk you know, netherlands belgium austria uh, they all experiencing extremely high uh, prices for electricity which obviously is driven by natural gas and uh, and high where high temperature in france specifically where they had to shut down some of their nuclear power plant capacity because uh, any power generation facility uses a lot of water to cool down and <laughs> similar i'm pretty sure that similar prices are in italy uh, switzerland probably in spain something similar is going on uh, and this is really killing industry the uh, 645 uh, means that this is uh, uh, six euros 45 cents per kilowatt hour uh, for electricity. So just so everybody understands, uh, just divided by 100 and that's your price per, kil per kilowatt. Uh, this is obviously no industry can survive such prices. So as a result, uh, there is one more to go in Poland. Um, uh, Poland has a uh, sort of national like uh, integrated uh, uh, company, uh, oil, oil and gas company called Orlan. Uh, it owns a bunch of refineries, uh, probably also owns uh, uh, crude production, uh, has some crude production, we don't know much details, but uh, it also has uh, fertilizer, uh, nitrogen, for, uh, uh, basically, uh, yeah, nitrogen fertilizer production, which uses natural gas as feedstock. So they stopped uh, production of that, uh, the, at that or those facilities. So as you can imagine, there is even fewer fertilizers fertilizer on the market. So, um, and just a reminder, uh, there was another fertilizer plant stopped yesterday in Germany. <clears throat> um, uh, UK also stopped uh, many fertilizer plants at the beginning of the war. So uh, a situation becomes really, uh, call it difficult, and the threat of the food security threat is becoming very, uh, real for the next year if things don't change somehow and then really at this point the only solution that can be done that sort of realistic and practical uh, is just to restart uh, uh, coal power plants that's just really um, what's left and uh, yes they are they are dirty uh, relative to other sources of energy but at the same time it gets to the survival uh, all the population and you can even see if there is no movements on that direction that really means that situation is going to get is going to be getting only worse uh, also in ukraine uh, in terms of natural gas production 
there are some problems because this Naftagas, which is we discussed, a uh, super corrupt uh, company, uh, government control, source of huge, um, so to call it white collar uh, corruption, uh, announced that they, you know, re reducing production of natural gas because some of the areas are close to the front line and they couldn't produce and so on. So basically, what this really means is that. Uh, if it were private producers, they probably would continue producing, but uh, because it's all corrupt and government run, uh, there is never incentive to really produce more. There's only incentive to produce actually less and charge high prices. Basically, it's monopoly. That's how it always works and how it always will. So, uh, so Ukraine is also getting less natural gas, so definitely it will not have enough to get by through the winter. Uh, also, as we discussed, uh, Russian sort of command, Russian leadership is trying to disconnect uh, Zaporizhian nuclear power plant uh, from Ukrainian power grid. And that's, that power plant is about 20% of Ukrainian electricity production. So if it gets disconnected, that really means that uh, Ukrainian um, electricity generation is uh, also on the edge of its ability to uh, to supply uh, the country and also what this really means and specifically going into the winter maybe right now there is some you know some sp still spare capacity uh, but going into the winter situation will become really dire in Ukraine as well uh, at the same time now let's move to the US uh, natural gas market there <clears throat> so the prices for natural gas just dropped a little bit like probably five six percent in the US the only reason they dropped uh, is because uh, in Texas there is an um, uh, LNG facility near Houston through which the most of the export is, is going to Europe. And that facility uh, think caught fire, some, some kind of delay. So it will be, um, so the natural gas export will start like with a delay of months, month, month and a half. Basically, it's supposed to start end of October, start, uh, oh, sorry. I think beginning of October and it's going to start sometime uh, mid-November. So because of that, basically it's a bottleneck, right? So the more natural gas stay in the U.S. Uh, internal market, so less will be exported, so the prices drop a little bit. But the differential uh, between the prices for natural gas in Europe and U.S. are so huge so that so that it's almost like you're selling narcotics. So the incentive is extreme uh, for the U.S. producers, for U.S. exporters, to push out as much natural gas out of U.S. as possible to Europe specifically, and they will find ways how to solve this problem. U.S. is pretty quick on sort of um, in terms of reacting when there is a huge sort of money incentive, so profit incentive. Let's put this way. So we're pretty sure that they will find ways how to increase capacity as soon as possible. Uh, just for the reference, natural uh, gas prices in uh, Asia are 1,600 uh, US dollars per thousand cubic meters. So just and just a reminder, in Europe it's 3,000. So all of the natural gases from from everywhere in the world is being redirected to Europe because it, it's the highest bidder uh, at this point. So that's the situation uh, in terms of uh, energy, electricity, uh, and even how it affects uh, food production. Then uh, also there's new numbers from Russia in terms of its export of uh, grains. And they're about 6 million tons for July and whatever we have this uh, 20 days of August. Uh, it's uh, uh, well below their record numbers and it's, uh, they, they basically went back to 2017. Uh, in terms of uh, amount of being exported. So you can see here as well, uh, there is less of um, grain supply coming to the world market from Russia as well. Um, so we, we kind of like uh, moving more and more into this perfect storm uh, situation, which probably will happen sometime in the winter if things don't change. It's obviously assumes that the current energy policy and will continue will persist and uh, then then there will be some some very bad surprise uh, some kind of storm sometime in the winter 
Uh, now let's actually uh, move uh, back to Ukraine, back to the uh, frontline situation in Ukraine. Uh, as a heads up, nothing major was happening uh, today. Uh, Russian uh, troops continued their attacks. Uh, so far, they were not, um, they didn't really gain much ground anywhere. But let's just do walks through the front line. We'll, we'll also, and I'll, I'll show a little bit more in detail what's going on on the Kherson bridgehead and specifically with that Russian attack. But first, let's just start from the very north and move down south in a clockwise fashion. So, first of all, along the state border, situation is uh, essentially the same. Uh, a relatively low activity there. Now let's move to Kharkiv area. Uh, things here also on post quiet so far. Uh, it's very clear this is not a priority for the Russian command at this point. Uh, now let's quickly jump to Zoom bridgehead. Uh, it was essentially quiet uh, uh, today. Nothing really major happening there. Uh, then let's move to North and Bus front line. Here, attacks were essentially in the same place as uh, basically Solidar, uh, Vesele, Bakhmut, and then if we go a little bit south, uh, we can see this uh, Zaitseve uh, and Kadema are the major sort of uh, places of tension. And then also uh, Russian troops now trying to kind of uh, attack from the south in, with obviously the idea, uh, you know, creating a threat to the flanks of the defenders uh, in Bakhmut. Uh, none of those attacks were successful so far um, uh, today. It doesn't mean that uh, the, the defenses are sort of strong and, and we can kind of assume that everything's going to be fine. No, just, uh, uh, just a day, let's put this way. Uh, now let's move again somewhat south. Let's see what's going on west of Donetsk. Things here are kind of the same, no many, not, not really changes. There's still this attempt to uh, create in circle of DF call create credible threat and force withdrawal of Ukrainian troops, which so far doesn't you know didn't have much progress today. Uh, at the same time, there is a, a significant am amount of artillery uh, fire here near Piski, and then there were attacks uh, at Novomikhailivka here, uh, and then there is renewed attack at Zolotaniva. So this is actually, uh, we would like to discuss a little bit more. This goes back to the idea that this looks more and more that uh, Russian command is uh, sort of, has decided to do this kind of like a northern and southern pincer and sort of, let's just, this is, uh, sorry, let's just go back. So this is going to be northern, this is going to be southern pincer. And essentially the idea is kind of either encircle all of the Ukrainian troops or force their withdrawal to basically on the western border of the Donetsk region, essentially. Uh, so because the, the immediate goal that uh, Russian leadership has put uh, uh, on the table for the uh, Russian military command is to capture the remainder of the Donetsk region. Uh, actually, technically, Russian troops have, uh, have not captured fully Luhansk region. The Ukrainian forces still hold two or three villages. So, so nominally, uh, Russian uh, troops still don't control fully Luhansk region, but obviously the fact that they, they effectively control it. Uh, so that's why there's a sort of immediate objective that uh, Russian troops are facing at this point, capturing this remaining uh, part of the Netsk region. Uh, let's actually uh, quickly look here. Nothing has changed in this map. As you can see, this is from August 21. Uh, Russian troops have not made uh, any progress so far at this point here. Uh, now let's move to uh, the Parisia front line. Just a quick look. Again, this is uh, this wedge that was built sometime in uh, April, if I believe correctly. Uh, and then this is new attacks. And the whole point of all of these attacks is to destroy two key strongholds of Ukrainian army, Velika Novosilka and Vogladar, which will uh, open the sort of gates for the further advance uh, towards north of this uh, group, uh, um, this Russian group uh, group that's here. Uh, by the way, uh, on just forgot to mention, what we are observing is that 
most of the Russian units from Kyiv West attack group has returned back to the front line. So, for example, we know that 31st Airborne Brigade is back on the front line. Uh, we believe they are somewhere here west of Donetsk or this area where sort of like this uh, southeastern corner where this uh, um, the attacks here at uh, Vogledar, Zlataneva and so on. So basically most of it is, uh, most of these units are functioning uh, again uh, in full force and probably from Kiev East uh, attack group. So uh, just for the reference, um, so we know because the specific was 31st Airborne Brigade suffered heavy losses. Uh, during attack, the same as 11th Airborne Brigade, uh, they, they suffered heavy losses uh, west of Kyiv. Uh, but uh, now they back uh, and uh, they in full force, so to say. Uh, now let's move to Kherson Bridgehead. This is uh, just confirmation of what uh, I mentioned yesterday, that it seems to be that the uh, Ukrainian side has evacuated this uh, salient, and, and that's, that is correct information. So you can see uh, this is kind of like new Russian uh, ter uh, territorial gain so far. Let's actually look, so look at a little bit more uh, detailed map. So this is uh, Snihorivka here. Uh, this is Snihorivka, as you can see. And this is uh, where Russian troops, they kind of attacked north uh, and uh, went through Vasilki and captured this village Blagodatna, as you can see here. So they, they just kind of increased their buffer. We were still uh, puzzled by this whole move here, honestly. And maybe this is just move of the sort of like pass of least resistance. Uh, so Russian troops felt like Russian command felt that there is like weakness in defense and sort of like, okay, let's just capture this territory. That's the best explanation we have because uh, the obviously very clear objective is not to go in sort of between these two rivers, but the, the objective is to uh, capture Mikolaev. And uh, other important objective here is Kriviri. So obviously the attack to Kriviri should be somehow, somehow from here, which is not happening. And then Mikolaev is, as you can imagine, the short, the short sort of pass is this road, that direct ro road between Kherson and Mikolaev. But you know, the attack is kind of really in uh, in the northern direction that really doesn't kind of go anywhere. Uh, there's also a report by Russian command that they captured the village Alexandrovka, which is here next to Stanislav. This is actually kind of like fraudulent recycling uh, of the old news. They always controlled that village for the past uh, probably three months. Uh, they haven't captured anything. This is essentially, they just thing that people don't know, don't don't remember, so they just say some village and it sounds like there is some kind of progress. Uh, but in, in reality, they controlled that village uh, for a while, so there was no real progress here. The only progress is this area here near, near Blahodatne. Um, that's all. Uh, again, thanks for watching and until tomorrow, bye-bye.